thought Beth was true. All right, we are going to uh, to try to have an interactive um, experience here today, which I know from my experience as a teacher either is making people happy or groan right now, but that is what's happening, whether you're happy about it or groaning about it. We are going to work together and try to um, start brainstorming and, um, ideas about how we can create these communities of care in our classes. So we have such um, a short window of time, so I feel like we're just going to barely be able to scratch the surface, but hopefully this will give people opportunities to start considering what they're doing already that is supportive of students' um, mental wellness and also what they might be able to adapt or, um, or start fresh with as we move into this new school year. So um, first, I just want to give a brief overview of trauma-informed um, pedagogy and what that means and um, to kind of give a little bit of one possible context of why these issues matter. So I am just realizing that I'm saying all these things and I'm looking at all my slides and they're so nice and you can't see any of them. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and you haven't missed much so that's lucky. Um, and also I would like to invite you to at any time um, add any thoughts or ideas into the chat um, as part of our interactivity. Okay, so let me move forward. So to discuss trauma again, just briefly, the idea of trauma is that trauma is an event, series of events or set of circumstances that, it ex that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, or emotional or spiritual well-being. And um, I think that as we consider this broad definition of trauma, I feel like probably we all can observe things that we have noticed in ourselves and others, both individual and collectively, that we've experienced um, over the past year, over our lifetimes that inform what we bring with us to our jobs, to our classrooms, to our personal relationships. I would argue that trauma is a fairly universal experience, which is not to say that everyone's trauma is equivalent, but that we all experience trauma um, and that it, it impacts and shapes the way that we engage and are able to engage with what we'd like to do or what we need to do. To be trauma-informed um, in any context, this is specifically about educational context, but to be trauma-informed in any context is to understand how violence, victimization, and other traumatic experiences may have figured in the lives of the individuals involved and to apply that understanding to the provision of services and the design of systems so that they accommodate the needs and vulnerabilities of trauma survivors. And my, I once was at a presentation that someone was giving about trauma-informed pedagogy and someone in the audience said, how do we know if our students are traumatized? And the presenter said, just assume that they all are. Because if we assume that everyone is bringing with them some level of trauma, then we are able to design our experiences in ways that um, are accepting of and inclusive of people who are uh, struggling or who may be um, may face trauma even in, in that semester in our class. Okay, I'm gonna push this over to Beth. Okay, all right, thanks everyone. And in advance, apologies if my son comes in again. I said he should only interrupt me if the house was on fire if he was bleeding, but macaroni and cheese apparently equates um, in his mind to both of those things. Um, so one of the things that Rachel and I wanted to uh, the, re the impetus for our presentation was essentially that we all are hearing about uh, the return to normal and how we should return to normal and and the expectation with that normal is that we should ramp up our productivity and we're not here to argue that we shouldn't be productive individuals in society and in schooling but but to perhaps push against the idea just a little bit in terms of like what does returning returning to normal mean um and especially since i think both rachel and i would argue that we're still COVID-19 is still here. Uh, I've had a hard time dealing with the drought, that there are things in the world that are still very much influencing our mental wellness. And so rather than 
just sort of continue with the trend of like, let's return to normal and increase and increase, we wanted to take a moment to pause and to, and to think about like, how can we intentionally take what we learned and apply during our pandemic pedagogies and continue to apply them? Um, uh, for, and just briefly, because a lot of us as teachers, we have things that Rachel and I will talk about later in, in the presentation about like being more flexible and adaptable. And there, there's a little bit of a slight, a slight pressure to be like, okay, how do we go back to what we were? And so we want to sort of intentionally bring the best of both worlds um, into our pedagogy. So in terms of prioritizing mental wellness, uh, Rachel and I were thinking about uh, just our own personal and professional and pedagogical priorities. And for me, um, and we're, we're going to invite all of you to do the same thing in a moment, um, but reflecting on my personal priorities, how could I personally decide to do less rather than return to normal? That was one of my goals over the summer. So, so while a lot of folks were returning to normal and going and traveling, I, and, and I'm not, this is what worked for my family and my macaroni and cheese. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you. See, it worked. It, okay, that was excellent. So instead of going and traveling everywhere, we decided to stay, <laughs> to stay home. <laughs> and then my son very nicely brings me macaroni and cheese. So that is a personal example of how, um, that just made me so happy, of uh, trying to intentionally do less um, could create a, a better circumstance. That doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that what we were doing, especially in terms of teaching, was less useful. Um, or, or less helpful, but that we were doing more with less. In terms of professional prioritizing, I also consciously made the decision this year not to apply for a national conference that I always present at. Just thinking is like how, in terms of prioritizing my own mental health and my own time and my, the time I give to everyone here at USU, um, making the decision not to do that and instead taking the time to put more energy into presenting at things like ETE, which actually fulfill me and rejuvenate me a lot more because there's more interaction. Rachel? So Beth described some examples of how in her professional life she um, purposefully shifted and paused to decide what was most valuable and restorative to her. And this is something that I've thought about quite a bit um, in my role as a teacher as well. And I know that Beth has and probably many of you have. Um, which obviously is for us inextricably connected with our professional work. Um, so in reflecting, so I've been teaching college writing for about 16 years, and um, I have seen so many shifts, um, I think for the better in the way that we're engaging with students and their, um, their mental health, and hopefully also a little bit with our own mental health and wellness as well. Um, but the pandemic gave me uh, surely an additional opportunity to consider what it was that I was doing in the classroom and why. And I, um, just to give a couple of, of brief examples, and, um, and again, we'll, we'll talk more about some of these changes. One of the things that I've always typically been willing to do is that if someone, if one of my students comes to me and says, something has blown up in my life and I would love to have an extra day or two on the, on an assignment. Typically, like, I don't even need to know why, like, sure, you can have an extra day or two on the assignment. But in the past, I usually waited for a student to ask for that. And so what I decided um, during the pandemic is that I would make that more apparent. So instead, when we, an, a, an assignment due date was approaching, I would send out, for example, a reminder saying, don't forget that this draft is due on whatever day. And also, if any of you have run into some difficulty and need an ex a little bit of extra time, please let me know. And so I made that apparent with every assignment submitted. And again, not because I feel like deadlines don't matter, but I consider some of my own experiences as a professional, and it's difficult for me to imagine many scenarios where I would not be extended that grace if I needed it as a professional. I'm not quite done. Can I have a little bit more time? It's difficult for me to imagine um, many contexts where they would say, no, you can't, um, that's it. But sometimes I, I started to notice that maybe that's the impression I was giving to students. So I might be more willing, like, you know, in, in practice to give them a little bit of, of grace um, 
but I wasn't telling them that. And so how are they to know? And a lot of people are not willing to ask for that or too afraid to ask. So I just tried to set up a set of circumstances that would hopefully reduce that fear of asking for grace when grace was what they needed. So that's just one example. Um, and I hope that as you've listened to, again, just these few little examples that Beth and I have shared that you have started to consider some of the um, things that you have noticed that you've adapted or shifted in your own uh, teaching or professional life. So in the interest of sharing, I am going to give you, I'm gonna put in the chat a link to a Padlet board and the Padlet board has these questions. And so we'd like to take just a few minutes to consider this. Um, and actually I'm noticing I'm like rolling over you, Beth, but this is supposed to be you facilitating this moment. <laughs> Facilitate away. I am prioritizing my mental health. And that's right. <laughs> See, that's why it's good to collaborate because uh, she knows I'm not actually trying to steamroll her. I just am forgetting which of us were doing which part. But this is the idea is that there are aspects of our pandemic ped pedagogies. What we have done since the start of the pandemic for example, being um, increasing in our flexibility or adaptability, trying to be more deliberately student-centered, trauma-informed. What were some of those things that you started or continued from last year? And what practices do you really want to continue? The second idea is, what do you miss about pre-pandemic times that if given the opportunity, and maybe that opportunity is this semester, I'm teaching web broadcast again this semester, so it feels very similar to you know peak COVID. I feel like we're kind of still peak COVID. The peak never ends. Uh, so, but what are some things that you would love to see a return to and why? And then how can your practices, whether these are new practices or continuing practices, benefit both your mental wellness and your students' mental wellness? And so it would be great if we could take um, three or four minutes to kind of share ideas in the Padlet and I will share that um, here. And then we can um, take maybe a little bit of time uh, to have some people share their own, like to pull out more from that, okay? So does that link show up for everyone? Okay, so let's take a few minutes. I'm actually gonna stop sharing for a moment um, to give everyone some kind of quiet reflective time to work on that Padlet and then we will kind of share those answers together. So about three to four minutes.
All right. So, so now I would like to invite folks to, to do some oral discussion. So uh, there are a couple of things that I really noticed was interesting on, on the group share, the Padlet. Um, so, but I'd love to hear responses from a few people. What are some things that, that you deliberately started doing during the pandemic that you're hoping to continue? And I think as Rachel was saying that explicit um, uh, modeling for students, helping them understand that we're still in doing these things, trying to um, acknowledge our collective mental health and take care of that and prioritize that. So anyone like to share? We can also use the chat too. I, I'll, I'll go. Um, one of the things that I did uh, in a, it was a small class. I don't think you could do it in a large class, but um, which I've really never done before was just, you know, 30 second check ins for all the students and myself. And there were only 10 of us in the class, so it really was quite small, but we did that, you know, every week and just in terms of how they're feeling in, in COVID and I, sh you know, we were all up and down all semester. And I think it was um, very helpful for them to see how up and down I was because I was pretty honest about, you know, my stress level that particular week or how my writing, my publishing was going and things like that. And I think it really helped um, them, you know, understand that, that, you know, I'm human and you know, have all these multiple responsibilities just like they do and stuff like that. So I, I really liked that. I don't know how, you know, how that would transfer to a large lecture class, but, but I, I was glad I did it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's really important in terms of modeling. Like, it's, And I think you could do it with a large lecture class too. Letting students know here are the things I'm dealing with and here's how I'm trying to, to cope and manage and balance. Um, anyone else? One other thing in terms of what you're intentionally going to be transferring over. One thing that I wanted to highlight from the board, um, I don't know who wrote it, but uh, showing our vulnerability um, in a way that I think is also helpful for us. And I think we're all, we're often talked about how like we do need to show that and model that we're vulnerable for students, but also have a balance of like showing our vulnerability, but also, um, making sure that we don't feel like we're overextending that for students. Okay. Um, uh, one other person, oh wait, yeah, go ahead, Rachel. I realized we're short on time. Okay, let, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Beth. I was trying to rearrange screens. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's All okay. Right. Go ahead. No, go. You can go next. So we uh, wanted to talk about, again, some just brief ideas about some concrete steps toward deliberate pedagogies that we might implement in our um, in our classrooms. And I just wanted to follow up with something um, about kind of emphasizing and prioritizing self-care and sharing those things with students. I don't even remember if we talk about this later. And so I might be repeating something later or just ignoring it later. But one thing that I have noticed is that students know if you are doing what you're suggesting they do, especially when it comes to self-care. So I have had some really wonderful mentors who really talk a lot about self-care and make sure that as a PhD student, you take this time for yourself and that you do things that enrich you. And then I'm watching that I'm thinking, you don't do this thing. And it's very obvious to me. And so I know it's very obvious to our students. So it's one thing to talk about it. And I think talking about it matters. So I don't mean to dismiss this idea that even if we can't practice it, that we should not bring it up because I think that just the conversation matters. But I also think it's important to note that our students, that they do see us as models of behavior. So to really consider like, what am I actually doing to take care of my own mental wellness? Not just telling students that I think it's important, but showing that it's important as well. Okay. Okay, so a couple of different things that you might consider that are more student focused in terms of concrete applications. These are two resources that um, the university has for us. And the first one is called the ACT Guide. It's acceptance and commitment, self-care self 
therapy, self-help program. And it's a program that students can use for free for I believe six months. Um, and it's a resource that's available for students. The second one is a 45 minute mental wellness module that you could offer for credit or extra credit. So for example, I am using this in the first week of a class that I'm teaching in the fall when we're kind of ramping up toward the um, kind of the content of the class, I am saying I prioritize your mental wellness and this is a helpful module that won't take you very much time. It's a low stakes assignment that I'm asking them to complete in the first week of school. Again, as a way to signal that I value their mental wellness and that I want to help provide them with some concrete resources to address their mental wellness. Here are a few other just kind of small things that you probably already do. So I definitely don't think that Beth and I are thinking without us, these people would not know what to do. So I think that you could have, any one of you could have easily taught this um, or facilitated this discussion. Um, consider attendance policies and deadlines. And note that we're not saying you should have X type of policy or X type of deadlines, but consider what are your attendance policies? What are your due date policies? Why are they like that? Why do you value the policies that you have? And if you don't value them, consider how you might adapt them to be more trauma-informed um, and more inclusive. And if you want ideas about what that might look like, I think Beth or I um, both have uh, considered this quite a bit and could help troubleshoot and share ideas. Cut back on readings or assignments in order to go deeper into content. So maybe there, maybe you reduce the number of readings, but really dig into them deeply. Um, Think about this idea of pauses. How do we pause? When do we pause? How long do we pause? What different types of pauses do we have? And then the last one is something that I've done for many years, which um, I think several people wrote about something similar on that Padlet, but um, what, are, what are ways to check in with students? So personally, I do a weekly check-in where I ask two questions. One question is related to um, course content, so I can gauge understanding of content and ideas. The other one is related to people. So how are you doing? What's the success you've had that you'd like to share with me? Um, is there anything that um, is that you'd like to share that's um, kind of become a barrier to your success in this class? These are all invitations to share. So sometimes people say, I don't really have anything to share this week, and that's totally fine, but I invite them to share in a way to connect with them as individuals um, and not just as students with assignments. And for me, this has been particularly useful. Um, I started doing it in, in asynchronous online classes, but I found that I started to think, I know my asynchronous online students way more than I know my face-to-face -face students, even though I literally am interacting with my face-to-face -face students multiple times a week. So I started implementing these into face-to-face -face classes as well um, to give more opportunities for um, real connection in those classes. All right, and just briefly um, pointing back to our wonderful keynote that we that we heard earlier, I thought the presenters did a really nice job at like pausing and saying and asking the students like, "Am I going too quickly in my lectures, or am I doing other things?" And then collecting the data that we all need as teachers in order to document. So I thought that that self assessment of the class is a good place to pause as well. We were also thinking about concrete applications in terms of focusing on ourselves. So we all, of course, have heard of the idea of strategize how and when to say yes and no. And I am perhaps the world's worst role model in how to do this because I say yes to everything and I have a lot of people asking me to, to do things. Um, so one of the things that I've had to start actively doing is, is, is even if I am still needing to say yes, is to actively write down what I am being asked to do before I respond an email so that I can take some time to like deliberate on like, will I be able to still fulfill my commitments to my teaching and administration and, and my service and everything if I say yes or no. And so, so again, pausing, and sometimes I might still need to say yes, but then also like, what else can I, can I actively cut off my list if I need to say no? The other thing, and I'll, I'll have to do a shout out to our wonderful department head, Phoebe Jensen, um, but communicating with supervisors, colleagues, or, or others who, when you're feeling overwhelmed, that is something that I tried to intentionally do during the pandemic, is communicate with my department head when I was saying I'm feeling overwhelmed now, and together we would strategize on how to, how to help reduce it. Um, I recognize not everyone has a department head that they can do that with, but, but finding colleagues or, or mentors or friends where um, I think the venting system, where we're like, ah, I'm overwhelmed, is helpful. But then also making it an, a concrete time to be like, okay, 
I actually want to strategize how to reduce some of the things that I'm doing. Um, people come to me um, all the time with that since I direct that composition program. And one of my favorite things to do, I think I've told this decree, is you need to grade less. You need to respond less in writing to your students. You need to find ways to facilitate it so you're still giving feedback, but that you are taking less time. And so be, having someone who can affirm that, yes, we need to help you do less and here's how to way to do it, but that's still helpful for your content and helpful for your students and helpful for you as a teacher. Um, and then we talked earlier about sharing with students your own strategies and follow them. They notice and people notice when I'm not following my own strategy. Rachel, next. Oh, I like that. And then Cree said, conversation with my, with my PC. I asked, can you help me figure out when I can take advantage of the opportunity to say no? Cree, do you want to say one, one comment about that? I think that's really important. Oh, sorry. I shared it in the chat real quick, but I, I'm a second year lecturer. So my first promotion advisory committee meeting was last year. And I was just like already feeling overwhelmed because it was my first year teaching and it was just super chaotic. So the question I said, and I, and I always try to be diplomatic, but I just said, when can I take advantage of opportunities to say no to things? Because I've been getting these emails and now I feel like I have to do them. And so they kind of just helped me create this triage list of things that helped me fulfill my role statement and made me impactful and that would keep me on the track to be to come up for promotion on time, but also recognize like I don't have to say yes to everything in order to be a good candidate for promotion later. So I just threw that in there. Thanks, Karina. Thank you. So uh, this slide with the question about joyfulness is based on a conversation I had with um, a friend of mine who is faculty in music education at Weber State. And he, I had known someone who had taken his music ed class and they were like playing, learning to play the ukulele and they did kazoo choirs and it was just like, so he'd come home and his sister is also in college. So this brother would come home and be playing the ukulele and his sister would be doing chemistry. And she's like, I chose the wrong major. Why can't I do this? So I was telling this to my the professor friend and he said, there's nothing magical. People think that elementary education is just automatically fun and joyful, but all learning can be joyful. And that really struck me. And it made me think like, what does that mean for learning to be joyful? Because um, he was convinced that that chemistry class could be a joyful learning opportunity. And that was really interesting to me. So that's where this question is based on. How can I make my work joyful? How can I make learning joyful for my students? And again, this idea of joyfulness may not be a word that you particularly like are, are considering, but there might be other words that matter to you. How can I make my work more meaningful? How can I make my work lighter? How can I make my students feel lighter in my classroom? There's a lot of different words that that you might be considering. Um, I'll just share briefly, I made this, it says joy in the middle. And I decided that I would put my money where my mouth was. And this is about, this is more answering the first question. How can I make my work joyful? And I decided I would make this and put it on my wall above my computer where I could see it. So I could remind myself of some of these initial thoughts and commitments that I want to make to myself. Um, I'm going into my third year of my PhD program. It has been a very stressful time to um, be in school. And there have been many times where I thought there are a lot of other things I could be doing. And so in order to kind of combat that, like I need to find ways to make my work more joyful, that matters to me. So think about what matters to you and how you could make some commitments to yourself, to your students, to help increase whatever it is you want to increase in your life. So that's just kind of like a place for thinking. All right, and so um, we were hoping to give you a few minutes to, to do the joyful or the pause or the meaningful circle and, and, and plan out. So do that right now if you want, um, or the other, um, Actually, that was really bad modeling of my pedagogy. Do this thing or do this other thing that I'm going to talk to you about. Anyway, um, in the chat, I am putting one more Padlet. If it's helpful. Um, but the and then these questions are the things we'd like you to consider as we finish this session. So we've collectively come up with a list of of applications um, and then Rachel and I have shared some other thoughts. So what are, what's one thing that we might add to our list of applications? Um, what might you take away 
and what's one concrete strategy you will employ this semester. So in terms of me being a, a non-structured teacher, the structure part of the keynote, I was like, oh, I need to work on my structure. Um, I'm going to have you, um, uh, are you sharing the Padlet? Or All right, just a heads up, we are over time. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then these are the three questions we want you to be thinking about because essentially our takeaway is when everyone's like, how can you return to normal? How can you also pause? So, and with that, we are done. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you all. Yes, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I guess Beth and Rachel, if you want to have people continue to participate, you can take that over to Mighty Networks, make a post, stick the Padlet in there, and then more people can kind of consider and have access to these resources. Um, but thank you all for being here, and we'll see you in the other sessions. Thanks, Beth and Rachel.